this is AQA Psychology and we're looking at the topic of gender um, and in this particular video we're looking at this last bullet point, gender identity disorder and we're looking at biological explanations. Um, now before I start you should be aware the term gender identity disorder is a little outdated now. It's most recently been replaced with the term gender dysphoria which you may be uh, familiar with. However it was felt when the, the most recent version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual was produced that the term disorder was creating some stigma. So it's been replaced now with the term gender dysphoria. However in this video because that's what the spec uh, calls it gender identity disorder. I'm going to continue to use that term um, through this video. Okay, what is gender identity disorder? Uh, basically, it's where you have a conflict between biological sex and gender identity. Where someone, for example, their biological sex might be male, um, but they feel really strongly that their gender identity is female. It's a conflict between the two. They're not in line with each other. Um, and that can cause significant distress, it can cause problems functioning um, and to be diagnosed um, these issues should have been there for at least six months and it should be shown by at least two of the following things. I'm not going to read through all of those. This is copied from the, um, the d diagnostic manual. Um, but to, to be diagnosed, um, an adult needs to show at least two of these um, following symptoms. Uh, they need they need to have had them for at least six months and they need to be accompanied by significant stress or problems um, functioning. Um, we're going to look at two possible causes of um, gender, disorder, gender identity disorder, brain sex theory and also genetic factors. So the first theory, brain sex theory, this is the idea that gender identity disorder is actually caused by um, specific brain structures which um, are not in line with biological sex. So what, what I mean by that is um, we have some brain structures which are actually different in males and females and the correct term for that is sexually dimorphic. Um, and one of those um, structures is this the stria terminalis. You see this abbreviated in your booklet to BSTC which stands for, the B stands for bed nucleus, the C stands for central, so it's the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis and it's the middle bit. You don't need to know that but um, it, uh, some people might want to know. So um, if you look at this picture on the right here what we've got is this purple line going round. That's the structure we're interested in here. It's a structure that goes around the thalamus um, near the chordate nucleus and it ends um, by the amygdala. Um, and um, you can see on the left here in a bit more detail, it's the green lines on the left. So the right, on the right, this picture should help you put it into context. It's a structure within the limbic system in the brain. Um, and what we should find um, in most individuals um, is that it's in keeping with their biological sex. So in males, this structure is about twice the size compared to females, or um, I think it's 40% bigger. Um, and it has about twice the number of neurons in. So if someone is biologically male, we should find that this structure is in keeping with that, that it's of the larger size. However, studies have shown that in people with gender identity disorder, it might be that um, those who are bi biologically male actually have a structure that is more in keeping with the size of a female stria terminalis, that it's of that smaller size. So if we look at this study on the left here, Zhu et al, um, they performed post-mortems on brains of people who had undergone a male to female transi transition um, and they, uh, if it had been in keeping, they would have found that those males uh, had the, the male size structure, the larger structure, um, the uh, stria terminalis, but actually they found that it was the female size, this structure, it was the smaller size in those six individuals. 
um, Krauver found a similar thing, but rather than looking at size, counted the number of neurons. And again, same result, the neuron count in those individuals was in line with what you would expect to see in a female. So the two are, are out of sync, basically. You've got someone who was originally a biological male, and they've got their, their brain structure fits with what you would expect to see in a female. So that's a possible cause of gender identity disorder. I say possible cause because there are issues with this theory which you may have spotted already. Obviously six brains is a very small sample size and the big question really is was this difference present before transition? Because it's entirely possible that the difference in structure was actually caused by the transition, by the female hormones, castration that occurred and so on. It may be that the, the um, stria terminalis have actually got smaller as a result of the individual going through the transition. We don't know because we're performing a post-mortem on these individuals um, after they have died. Um, the other issue here is that, um, that the difference in the, the stria terminalis actually doesn't develop until, until adulthood, that that structure is not sexually dimorphic until we're around 22 years old so we wouldn't see the difference until that point anyway but actually gender identity disorder normally emerges much earlier than that many people report symptoms right back into early childhood so that's um, a real issue with this particular theory equally cause and effect can't be proven um, all you can say is that there's a link because it might be that someone has gender identity disorder and then that causes the change in in the structure of their brain um, that causes the uh, stria terminalis to change size so we we can't prove that one leads to the other that's a really big issue with this theory Right, in favour of this theory, we've got those two supporting studies that we've already looked at. And the findings from those studies, from Zhu and Krauver, have also been confirmed by other studies, including some that have looked at individuals before they've undergone transition. So it's not just these two studies in isolation, but the disadvantages of the research are still present and the questions. So that's something that really still needs to be resolved. Right, let's look at this second um, theory, biological explanation, which is, is there a genetic component to gender identity disorder? And we're looking at one study here, which was a twin study. Halens et al. looked at 23 um, identical twins and 21 pairs of non-identical twins. What they're looking to see is, is there a higher concordance rate um, in identical twins compared to non-identical twins because that will suggest there's a genetic component. So in the twins, one of each pair has been diagnosed with gender identity disorder um, and what they actually found was that uh, the concordance rate was 39% for identical twins and zero for non-identical twins. So you can see there's quite a big difference there. Remember, concordance rate means w when they've both got it. OK, so evaluation. This does suggest that we have a genetic element here. The fact that the concordance rate is higher where you've got identical genetics. However, um, there are problems with twin studies. They're not perfect. Um, you know, non-identical twins may be boy and girl, so they may be raised quite differently. Um, and identical twins may be raised really similarly, so it's still made it maybe down to a difference in environment. We can't guarantee that that's down to a difference in genetics. Um, there's also really small sample sizes. Uh, 23 uh, pairs of twins is a really small sample size for a study, um, so that may mean that we can't generalise. It may be affected by outliers more and so on. Um, the concordance rate is not 100%, so it's not purely a genetic, um, it's not purely caused by genetic factors. Um, and equally, perhaps a solution here it could be that genetics create a vulnerability. We've talked about a diathesis stress before, where you have a, a genetic vulnerability, for example, and then that um, is coupled with an environmental stress of some kind or environmental factors which then trigger 
um, could trigger gender identity disorder. We've looked at that in many different contexts. So it could be that genetics create that vulnerability and then something else is, is triggering. So um, we, we can say that genetics may have an impact, um, but we can't say that it's purely down to genetics or purely down to biological factors.